Women and couples don't have children for many reasons, but the trend towards parenthood later in life means fertility is a growing consideration. Joining us now for more on the basic facts of fertility, Dr. Marjorie Dixon, co-founder and medical director of the First Steps Fertility Clinic in Toronto. Dr. Dixon, good to have you back here at TVO. Hi. The last good. time you were here, uh -huh. you looked different. Do you remember? Uh, yeah, I, I was with child. How many months? I was three months, but I, you could tell by my face that there was stuff cooking. <laughs> yeah. So this time I am so not. Now she is seven. So you were here seven years ago? Seven years ago, Well, yeah. it's good to have you back. It's long overdue, and it's great to see you again. <laughs> good to see Let you. me read this just to get us started here. Canada's fertility rate is at a low point, and one woman in six or 15% of Canadian couples are trying to get pregnant using medical help. The low fertility rate suggests women and couples are waiting to have children. And let's begin with some of the basic facts around that. Mm -hmm. What is, in your view, optimum fertility window for women to have kids? Well, that's a, it's a good question because it's physiologically, we haven't changed the evolution of the ovary. So what I say may shock people, but women are designed to have babies somewhere between the ages of 16 and 22. In terms of physical health? In, and in terms of egg quality and the ability to conceive easily. See how you were shocked? I was a little shocked because yeah, I don't think you're, you're recommending that necessarily. No, and I'm not saying yeah. that teenagers need to go have babies. But what I'm saying is I, it needs to be reinforced that the evolution of the ovary hasn't changed in the human race and that ideally the quality of our eggs is ready to be receptive to sperm at that time. I mean, the age of menses, the average age of menstruation is 13, 12 or 13 years. So if you think that when someone is, has the ability to ovulate, they could be sexually active, and they had a baby, that child would then have the opportunity to then conceive again at age 14. Hmm. So we would be grandparents when we're about 30 years of age. Yikes. That's evolution. Now, All right. So the best window, if it's 16 to 22, what happens after age 22? Well, there's a diminishing in the quantity and quality of our eggs. But really, the significant um, um, attrition that occurs increases after age 35. But there are studies that have shown that by the age of 30, we've depleted our ovaries of approximately 90% of its eggs, hmm. women. The good enough news is that the 10% that remains still has some relatively good functioning. After age 40, by age 40, we've depleted our ovaries of 97% of it. So size. if you get pregnant after age 40, mm -hmm. it's a miracle. It's not that it's a miracle. It is impressive, mm -hmm. and then the feat will be not only in bringing that pregnancy to term, but then also in having healthy babies, because we know that the intracellular environment or the environment inside of the egg is uh, diminishing in its ability to complete the splitting. When sperm and eggs meet, the chromosomes have to divide up and separate and grow into an uh, embryo. Um, and the chromosomes don't do so well because of the aging meiotic spindle, which is biology to English, say- English, please, English, Which yes. is biology to say that when the chromosomes need to line up and divide evenly, they tend not to do so, so well as we get older. And that's why there's an increased rate of miscarriage as we get older women. Right. And then there's an increased rate of chromosomal um, or aneuploidy, uneven numbers of chromosomes. So for example, things like um, trisomy 21, which is commonly known as Down syndrome, hmm. is more prevalent after age 35 and especially after age 40. And then other more common uh, chromosome unevenness um, trisomy or three of these chromosomes, 13 and 18, those are the types of things that eventually uh, don't bring out healthy babies and sometimes not compatible with life. And so women often are surprised when they come to my office. The average age of my patient is somewhere between 37 and 39 years of age. Um, there's been a huge paradigm shift. Women used to have their first babies in their 20s and there was much less infertility then. And now the average age of women having their first babies is up to 33, right? So let's, we're getting older. Okay, let's look at the other side of the equation. Yes. That's for women. How yes. about you? Okay, so women, 16 to 22, ideal by 35, degraded 90%, by age 40, degraded 97%. How about for men? Ideal age for them to be fertile and able to make babies. It's a little different because men make such an excessive amount of sperm um, as opposed to women that will release one egg in a month. Mm -hmm. So there is a diminishing f 
ability of sperm as men get older, but not as much as the eggs are concerned. So it's not similar, but when you look at infertility, 40% uh, of infertility can be attributed to male factor. Hmm. Um, and then as men age, there's an increased risk of things like schizophrenia in male offspring, for example, after age 45. So it's different. They will make less quantities of sperm, but because there's such excessive amounts of sperm, it is more easy to overcome male factor infertility with assisted reproductive technologies than it is female factor infertility. And is it the same that a, a male's most potent you tell me the right language to use here, but <laughs> highest potency for sperm is between 16 and 22? Well, yeah, they make the highest quantity of sperm at that time. But as I said, they can continue to make millions of sperm. The average um, that we look at for normal sperm quantities is 20 million per milliliter. That's a lot of sperm hmm. when it takes one sperm per egg. Right. But sperm is not as efficient as our eggs, let's say. Women are more efficient at everything, right? <laughs> I didn't say it, you said well, it. Well, okay. You were, you were implying it, I just inferred it. <laughs> Uh, when you're in the world of fertility treatments, mm -hmm. is there a cutoff beyond which you will say to somebody, sorry, we just can't do this anymore? Absolutely. What's the age there? Or For, is, it, is it an age or is it a it's, stage? Well, it's an, it depends on a multitude of factors, but generally speaking, IVF, in vitro fertilization, is not appropriate for women beyond the age of 45. And some would argue that the cutoff age should be 43. And that's because IVF can only be as successful as the egg quality. <laughs> and we know that the likelihood of live birth or take home baby is as low as one to 5% after age 43, hmm. no matter what we do. So I think it's important for people to understand that we call it assisted reproductive technologies because it assists natural reproduction. It is not um, improving reproductive technologies. It is not superseding reproductive technologies. It is assisting. Do you really send people home if they're over 43? Yeah, you sometimes. Do. Now, there are some 43-year-olds that are good candidates. They are the exceptional. They may be falling in that 1% to 5% range. And we select those out, and we can bring those to IVF. But we have to look at people's basic ovarian reserve parameters. So we look at certain objective tests, an AMH, an FSH, an antral follicle count, for example. So I don't know what any of that means, <laughs> but I assume it's important. It's important. These are important parameters when you look at an ovary um, and the ovarian functioning, because you need to really treat a patient on a case-by-case -case basis, but you still have to be cognizant of the age, because the age is the most important determining factor of people's ability to conceive where women are concerned. And that unfor is an unfortunate fact. I've been um, mal much maligned by f for turning people away sometimes when they say, well, I'm young, doctor. I, I exercise, I eat well, I, I take care, I sleep a lot, I am doing acupuncture and all of these holistic medicines. And I say, this is excellent for your health, but it will not necessarily change the quality of your eggs. Right? I want to get your opinion on something that transpired in the last few months that was really quite, uh, well, caught a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Facebook and Google offering to subsidize egg freezing for their female employees. Uh, I, I guess the assumption is you're going to be working so hard for us <laughs> that you may miss your window before the ages of, uh, you know, in your youth, mm -hmm. and therefore you may need to put off the decision to have children till a point where, you know, the lottery may not come through for you. Right. What do you think of that? Well, I'm an optimist, so I'm going to say that I, I think that they are really doing their homework and understanding the physiology of ovaries, and they are putting something out because they appreciate their female employees, not that they want them to be servants, but that they want to say, we understand that you are potentially uh, going to be needing to have assistance if you want to have children, if you're delaying it for education. There has been this paradigm shift. Women take time, they find partners that they actually like before they marry them. They go to get an education. They want to be financially stable. Sometimes they travel, so things are being put off. And assisted reproductive technologies is, are elective and cost money. So maybe the employers are just saying, we value you and we want to keep you as our employees and we will support you if you do have family building endeavors, not to say that you have to not have babies and work for us, absolutely. Okay, so I was going to say, th that's the positive interpretation that you put on it. Is there a more nefarious interpretation of this, you Possibly, think? Possibly, and that's, what I, the, that's what's been out in the press. So people are saying, well, how dare they? How dare they say, you know, work, 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 or your baby's later. 
they're not telling them when they can have access to those therapies or when they can take their maternity leaves. I mean, maybe the, it is a novel, genial thought. Hmm. What does it cost to do egg freezing, implantation it, later? It ranges somewhere between 8,000 and up to 15,000, depending on medications and what exactly is required and what the individual person's ovarian reserve is like. So the more daunting for people, I think, is, okay, so I have to have a procedure? You mean you're gonna stick a needle into my vagina, really? And it's, people are not necessarily wanting to take the time out of life to do that and then put potential health risks, bleeding, infection, uh, feeling unwell. Yeah. Does Ontario's yeah. health insurance plan pick up any of this? No. OHIP pays for nothing? No, but. OHIP is now considering they have put aside funds for the coverage of IVF. So they are looking at public funding of IVF for couples. It is being rolled out in fiscal 2015 as we understand it. So the government has said that we value our, the women in our Ontario population and we think that we want to make Ontario the best jurisdiction in which to have a family. It seems that that's what they're saying by putting this aside. And there are other jurisdictions in which IVF has been funded that has worked quite well in the UK, in Australia, um, in New Zealand, um, because it can be devastating to couples and females who struggle with infertility. It can be overwhelming emotionally, financially, and uh, women contribute to society in a positive way, and we want them to be as productive as possible, as happy as possible, as fulfilled as possible. It's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to have children, but for those who do, they should be able to have access to that care. And what's the success rate? It depends on your age. Here we go back to the age. So I know that I seem to be um, repeating myself, but your age is very tied in to your success rate per cycle. So less than 35, you will be the most successful with any assisted reproductive technologies. And it can range somewhere between 30 to 40% per cycle. Then after that, it starts to decrease. And as I said, after 43, it can mm -hmm. be as low as one to 5%. How many kicks at the cat will you let patients take? It depends on the patient. Generally, we say we do things in cycles of threes. So one to three cycles of the in vitro. And one cycle means you take the medications, your eggs are grown, they are extracted, combined with sperm, and then embryo transfers ensue until those embryos or the frozen embryos that also came from that cycle are used, that's considered one entire cycle. At what point do you say to your, do you call them patients or clients or what do you patients, call them? Patients. patients. At what point do you say to them, this just isn't on for you and you gotta get your head into a different space like uh, adoption or a life mm -hmm. without children? Always the conversation that I have when patients for whatever reason don't look like they have good prognosis. So I always present the options as, look, fertility is elective. So you can look at doing nothing, you can look at adoption, and then there is egg donation potentially. So often we have um, sisters or acquaintances, someone who is much younger than the intended parent from whom they have the opportunity to get eggs. I stimulate that individual, combine it with sperm, and then there are, of course, all kinds of implications. They have to have independent legal counsel, has to be carefully set out. You cannot pay someone for their eggs. You can't meet someone in a coffee shop and say, wow, you look great. Can I pay you <laughs> some money and you give me your eggs? That's not how it works. So it has to be very carefully laid out by physicians who are accustomed to those kinds of things. But it's not for everyone. And that's what I say to patients. You need to understand that there are all of these options but doing nothing is a very viable option. In your line of work, is that the worst news that you end up having to deliver to people? Basically telling them, you're the person who tells people you're not going to be able to have children naturally. Yeah, and, and so it, it's not a fun task to have. I mean, you go into this realm thinking that you're gonna be helping all of these families and the women that have struggled and men that have struggled with infertility and you wanna be able to give them a positive outcome, but you know, we do what we can to the extent of the science that exists now. And there are exciting and uh, new things on the way to improve egg health. And that's what is moving forward for assisted reproductive technologies. That will be the next chapter. But to this time, when we tell people, I'm sorry, there, there are no other options, it's an awful thing to do. Hmm. Nobody wants to be there. And patients don't come to see us because they want to see us. They come to see us because they must. And you know, we, as much as we are empathetic, I think that the lay press has kind of 
um, given us this, uh, imp given people the impression that we can fix any ovarian deficiency. And we're getting to the point where we have more things available to us to that end. But unfortunately, we haven't changed the evolution of the ovary yet, yet. There are still some appointments that are going to end in tears. Yeah, and that's why in my office, we have a whole cohort of other people. We have social workers at First Steps. We have um, a mind-body program. We have a support group that we offer to our patients, complimentary, and not even just to our patients, but to patients from other clinics who want to come. So we know how important it is um, for our patients to feel surrounded and in a good environment to maximize their ability to conceive at a time where it's kind of stressful and not fun to have to do it in such a contrived fashion. Gotcha. Um, but it's where a lot of couples are sitting right now, one in six couples, 15% of people trying to have children are having difficulty. So we're trying to deliver that care and the best, most empathetic, even though sometimes unfortunate bad news, um, but in a kind way. And we thank you for coming into TVO and making us better informed all about it. It's my pleasure. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.